Thank you. Ah, it's a pleasure to be here. My second visit to Russia, so it's nice to visit again. Um, let me see here. Hey, any rate, uh, so I'm going to talk about, this is a survey talk pretty much, on, uh, but I will, want to talk about uh, the um, total NP search problems. So I'm assuming people know what P and NP is, but I'll say a little bit about this in the, back, in the beginning at any rate. Um, so total NP search problems, these are search problems where you have a, a proof that something exists, possibly more than one something, and you're looking and you're trying to find one of the things that exist. And if you were in the morning talk by Sasha Shen, uh, this fits very well because he, uh, he gave a lot of proofs of existence where he used counting ar arguments. Uh, and this is the kind of thing where I view as a non-constructive proof. You know something exists because you count it. You know, in fact, a lot of them exist, but you now want to find at least one of them. So the definition of this class was given initially by Megiddo and Pop and Dimitriou, and the main founding paper for the area was the paper of Christos, Pop and Dimitriou in, from 1994. Uh, a total NP search problem, or TFNP for short. Okay, so TFNP, T for total, F for function, and NP for non-deterministic poly polynomial time. A TFNP search problem is a polynomial time relation, R of X, Y, which is total, so for every x, there exists at least one y, satisfying our xy. And it's also honest with polynomial growth rate so that the y has length poly polynomially bounded by the length of x. So, and the T a TFNP problem, a TFNP problem is solved by, if you're given an input as x, finding some value y such that r of xy holds. So all such y's or the minimal length? Any such y. Okay, now we know that there's a, pol a polynomial bound on the length of y, so we could always strengthen r to say that y is less than or equal to p of the length of, length of y. We know that length of y can be bounded by p of the length of x, so we could add that as an extra condition inside r and find one of the shorter y's, right? But definitely not the, the first one or anything like that. So this is the general problem. I'm gonna, most of my talk is gonna be giving examples of these things, uh, in fact. So uh, this is the basic definition for the talk. Let me just start, give a little bit of theory though. This is, TFNP is intermediate between pol polynomial time P and non-deterministic pol polynomial time NP. Um, should be a time there. Uh, just a little bit of notation for this slide here. FP means the set of functions which are computable in polynomial time as compared to the set of decision problems. Um, first theorem is that if P is equal to NP, then TFNP is solvable with, poly with, with polynomial time functions. And here the proof I say on the slide is immediate. You can just ask NP questions to query the bits, say, of the lexicographically first string Y. Okay, uh, it's, it's a not, a, not a many one reduction, it's a, a Turing reduction. Um, the second observation is that if the TFE, if TFNP e problems are solvable with some polynomial time function, then NP intersect co NP equals P. And the reason for this is if you have an NP intersect co NP predicate, it can be expressed both in the form exists Y A and in the form for all Y B, right? The first one being a NP definition and the second one being a co NP definition. So then the statement A of XY or not B of XY is a TFNP predicate because for every X there does exist a Y. Okay, um, and so NP inter so so thus problems in NP intersect co NP give rise to TFNP problems. So that's that's the, the proof there, right? That's the whole whole proof there because if you could find the Y, that would tell you either there exists a Y such that A holds or there exists a Y such that B fails, right? Um, every math talk needs a proof. I just gave you two of them, so we're done with proofs for the talk. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, but it's open, for instance, whether TFNP is equal to N, uh, FP to the NP, for instance. So, okay. Okay, so we're sitting as, as, a, as a theoretical thing, we're looking at problems between P and NP. So we're looking at the fine structure of complexity here between P and NP a little bit. Okay, and I got too many things to switch here. Okay, so 
The second observation is that this totality condition that for every x there is a y, it's a semantic condition, I mean, by which I mean it has to, it's something that has to be true, right? So it's not a syntactic class, it's a semantic class. And to go along with that, we have two open questions. First of all, we don't know if there's an effective enumeration of the TFNP problems. We sort of presume not, but we don't, don't know that. Uh, we don't know if there's a complete problem that sort of goes along, along with that. Usually, usually the, those things go hand in hand. Um, so what this, in practice, what this means, if we want to know that something's in TFNP, we need a proof of totality. So we need a proof that for every x there is a y satisfying this relation R. And the two main frameworks, there have been two, way, two main uh, schools working on this problem. The first is the original complexity theory approach, which is giving combinatorial principles that guarantee the totality of the relation. And the second one is in bounded arithmetic, where we have formal first order theories or even second order theories. And in these theories, we give proofs of totality and then work with those. Okay. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about both approaches in this talk here and mention also some new, new theorems. Um, and feel free to stop me as I go along with questions. Okay, so one of the very first examples, not the first in terms of time, but the first one I present is the pigeonhole principle. So um, here, the input for the pigeonhole pigeon principle TFNP problem, called PPP for short, uh, I'm not sure what the third P is, but anyway, there's three P's. Pigeonhole principle and an extra P stuck onto this. Uh, pigeonhole principle problem, I guess. So the input is a, a number X and a description of a function F, which is supposed to be an injective mapping from X into X minus one. Now, of course, there is no such injective mapping by the pigeonhole principle. So the output is finding a counterexample to F being injective and mapping X to X minus one. It's either a value A where f of a is not in x minus one, or it's a pair of values a where f of a is equal to f of b, showing it's not one to one. So these things have to exist by the pigeonhole principle. And from the, if you were at the talk this morning, you saw we saw a lot of counting things, which is how this worked there. So all those, most, I think everything you talked about this morning reduces to the pigeonhole principle, actually to the weak pigeonhole principles I'll mention later on. So um, the function, now x is the in, x is a input the, giving us the the domain of the function f. The function f is exponentially. If you coded up the entire graph of the function, say as a set of ordered pairs, the whole function is exponential size. So we don't want to have the input be exponential size. We want the input to be polynomial size. So accordingly, the traditional thing is that the function f is specified by giving a Boolean circuit. And the Boolean circuit takes an inputs of the appropriate length and has multiple outputs that encode the bits of f of x. The other way to do this is to use an oracle where you just have that given to you as a black box so it's not part of the input, it's just an oracle attached to the Turing machine. Okay. So that's important for us that the functions are only implicitly specified with a polynomial size definition. Okay. So uh, one more definition is the def notion of many-one reduction. So many-one reduction here of reducing the problem R to the problem Q, which we write R curly less than Q, is a many-one reduction of R to Q. If there's pol a polynomial time function F of X and a polynomial time function G of X, Y. So we're trying to, the idea is we're given an input X and we're trying to find a value for Y, making R of X, Y true. We take F of X, and we find a y making q of f of x true, right? And then we use y to get the solution to r. So the idea being we want to solve r, we instead solve q, and then we get our answer to r out of that. So we use f to reduce, to give a many-one reduction from r to q, and we, then we use g to get the answer to r back from an answer to q, okay? So then the formal definition of PPPP is it's the class of TFN, TFNP problems, many one reducible to the pigeonhole principle, to, to pigeon. Okay. Okay. And we'll, I'll, I wrote it again here. PPP will be specified by the combinatorial principle. There's no injective map from x to x minus one. Okay. So I usually just write things out this informal way here, just saying something simple like that and let you figure out what the problem must be. Okay. 
Good. Questions? So this is uh, the, the analog of a car production because it's a many-one reduction. This is the analog of a car production because it's a, it's a many-one reduction. We have an input x to r and we get to ask one query to q. Okay, q, we ask where, where's, what y makes q of f of x true. It's not, it's not a Turing reduction. We don't, we could, you, you could certainly do that as well and make multiple queries to q, but here we only allow one query to q. It's not known in general. Why the query has to be in this particular form, uh, not using the, the y part? Why do we only, because y is what we look at? Oh, yeah. Why is, okay. Yeah, we're not given y. Yeah, Shas is right. We're, not, we're, not, we're given only x. Our goal is to find y. There's two y's here. There's the y that makes r true, right? r of x, y. And then there's the y which makes q of f of x, y true. So we're given x, our goal is to find some value y making r of x, y true. So with f, x, we form a new query f of x and ask it to q. Actually, and for infinite case, such similar things, uh, this is, this, I think it's called viral degrees. Ah. If you do continuous mapping as reductions and, and kind of uh, descriptive set theory or something. Okay, so viral degrees, I've forgotten what they are. I've seen them before, but I've forgotten now. It's similar, though. For computable functionals or something. No, no, it's even, even in topology. So, so, for example, you can ask whether the, 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 the Brouwer fixed point theorem is viral reducible to, to some other topological principle, the non existence of, uh, uh -huh. of a transaction of, of a sphere. To, to, uh, this so, so, exactly like this. So, they take the, the input, they con uh, continue the transform into other input. Then they take any solution and it continues with transform. Yes. So, so and there are a couple of versions of that, right? So, so yeah, there are, there are weak, weak, stronger by production when you don't allow, for some strange reason, they don't allow to use X in the last transformation. But it's a bit stupid. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> so, I'll, this actually touches very, this comes very close to things I'm talking about later. I won't talk exactly about these kind of things, of course, but Brouwer fixed point theorem is an example in the discrete form of a TFNP problem. Okay, so in fact, with these things, these topological conditions have come up a lot in terms in this setting here, in fact. Yeah, that's, that's why, why. Yeah, that's why you mentioned it, good. <laughs> okay, so. Sorry, uh, uh, if you only fix that R and Q are decision problems, what if you want to just adapt the natural So these are, so, oh, this is a, so these, we're, we're treating R and Q as defining search problems. So they're not, they're, R and Q are decision problems, because they, so, but, they, but we're using them to define the search problem. If we constrain the discrete to decision problems, will it be just But it's not clear how to differentiate. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what you mean by restrict to decision problems. The point is, we're, we're given decision problems R and Q, but from that we define search problems and that's crucial that we're doing a search problem because if it was just a decision problem, y could either be only zero or one, then you would just check the two values and be done. So yeah. for example, if y is zero and one, then the negation is reducible to, 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 to the problem. If we just negate y. Right. And it's not, not. Yes, exactly, good point, yes. Different. Yes, yeah, okay, okay. So, so here's three more, these are the, these are, like the, uh, I was just giving you the core TFNP problems. So Papanimitru pa pa in his original paper identified these as being some of the main TFNP classes. PPA uh, for the uh, parity pigeon, sorry, parity principle argument says that any undirected graph in which all nodes have degree less than or equal to two ha and has which has at least one vertex of degree one, which is given to you as part of the input, in fact, has another vertex of degree one. Okay, so the point is, if everything has degree two or, or less, if you're given a node of degree one, you go to its neighbor. If that's degree one, you've d you're done, you've solved the problem. If that's degree two, you go to its other neighbor. If that's degree one, you're done, if otherwise you go to its other neighbor, and you just walk along this path, possibly an exponentially long path, but, uh, in the end, you eventually have to stop at another node of degree one because the graph is finite. 
Now, that's not, I said exponentially long. Again, the graph is given to you by some uh, function describing the neighbors of each vertex. So the graph is exponentially big, but it's implicitly defined by a appropriately set up uh, Boolean circuit or by an oracle. In this case, the sor circuit oracle, given a, a node as input in the graph, a node from the graph as in input, produces the neighbors of that node. Okay, so PPAD for uh, parity principle argument directed is if you're given a directed graph in which all nodes have both in degree and also out degree less than or equal to one, and you're given a node of total degree one, produces another node of total degree one. Okay, so this is like the directed version of PPA. And there's PPADS, this is S is for sync. Uh, if you're given a, a graph as in the previous problem, it's directed graph, everything has in degree less than or equal to one and out degree less than or equal to one, and you're given a source node, there must, be, there must exist a sync node someplace. Okay, so that's another search problem. And uh, all, these are all classes of problems. Again, the TFMP classes that go with these things, the set, things that are many one reducible to PPA in this, uh, set up in this way, okay. If you say that F can be represented by an oracle, then probably the reduction should also have some Transformation of the oracle. Yes. If you say that some problem is reducible to other. What do you mean? Uh, that's an excellent question. I was hoping to skip over, but that's a good point. That's absolutely true. You're given a reduction with the, the oracle as input, so you get to use the, You get to give a when you do the many one reduction. I didn't describe this on the previous slide, but I was trying to gloss over it. Is actually you're given the function as an say as an oracle, then you define a new polynomial time procedure using the previous oracle mm -hmm. to serve as the new oracle. Right. Right. Okay, okay, good. So still more. This is actually the very first local, uh, very first TFMP problem to be studied in depth in this way. It was actually studied by Papandreou along with well Johnson, Papandreou, and Jan Akakis a few years before the definition of TFMP it is PLS, a directed graph with out degree less than or equal to one, and has a non-negative integer-valued cost function which is strictly decreasing as you go along directed edges, okay? It must have a sink, something with no out degree. So the proof of this is you look at the minimal cost node in the graph, and it's gotta be a sink, right? Okay, so this is known as polynomial local search, and this was inspired by things like the, uh, uh, current, like the Kernigan and Ritchie algorithms, and, uh, um, uh, well, and the um, uh, dynamic, pro I'm sorry, too jet lagged here, uh, linear programming algorithms where you, you, you have a cost function that's decreasing, you know you're making progress, but you may have to keep local searching for exponentially many steps. Okay, okay. Uh, more, now we're sort of getting out of the, what are usually considered the core problems. Factoring, you're given an integer, greater than or equal to two, find a prime factor, okay? Nowadays, we know factoring is in uh, primality is in P, so this, as I've stated, is a TFMP problem. Okay. Smith, an odd degree graph, has an even number of, ha of Hamiltonian cycles. So your input here is you're given a, a graph, and you're given a Hamiltonian cycle in the graph, and your goal is to find another Hamiltonian cycle. And there's a very elegant proof that I'm not prepared to present that shows that you can actually transform one cycle into another one and the, the space of all Hamiltonian cycles in the graph forms an undirected graph with degree less than or equal to two everywhere, and you just walk through Hamiltonian cycles, okay? So that actually puts Smith into, uh, into PPA, okay? These last two problems are actually rather nice because there's none of this exponential graph or function hiding behind the scenes. Everything is there, right? You're just given a graph. And the space you're searching is something nice, like the space of all Hamiltonian cycles on that graph. Okay. Okay. Still going through the standard problems, and Nash was one of the ones that really first motivated it. Uh, the original papers on the TFMP class made a, talked a lot about Nash as being the main goal here. Uh, 
and it's, since we're at a higher school of, e of economics, it's a particularly good place <laughs> to talk about it as well, right? <laughs> so uh, a two-player game specified by payoff matrices has a Nash e equilibrium, meaning a mixed strategy, which is locally optimal. My LY is in the wrong spot there. I'll fix my, if you guys see typos, just email them to me or something like that, you know? I'll fix it online, okay. Um, a locally optimal for each player, so neither player can ch change his, his or her strategy to get an improved thing. And also, a likewise, positive linear complement, complementarity pro programs uh, have an n by n matrix M and a n vector Q, and if every principal minor of M is, has determinate positive, then there must exist an X and a Y, where Y equals MX plus Q, and uh, their inner product is zero. Okay. And they have non-negative entries. That's important, right? Positive part. Okay. So for Nash equilibrium, uh, it's known that there are some simple rational numbers, or, or so the output oh. should be should be. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, the output not. will be rational. Yeah, actually, also, um, let me see. I think actually, what they do is they actually, yeah, I think, yeah, the output is rational, but you can also talk about getting within epsilon. And, and people do that, study, stu study that as well. We have an epsilon tolerance for being locally optimal. Okay, both have been studied. And I could just say this has been, whoops, hold on. Um, there we go. So here's some complete problems. So for PPAD, this is the directed graph. You're looking for, you have to start with degree one node, and you're looking for another degree one node. There's a lot of, of many one complete problems. Uh, the original papers in, uh, mentioned the Sperner lemma, which is one of these topological things that I will talk about later on. Well, not this one, but other one. Uh, Nash was one of, as I said, one of the main motivating problems, and that was shown to be PPAD complete only in 2006. Um, the two-dimensional version of it, the, the, sorry, the two-player, two, two-player, 2D, the two-player Nash is shown only in 06. This should be two-player, not 2D. Sorry about that. Um, good slides will look good online. Maybe I'll send them to you or something like that. Uh, and then the 2D Brouwer fixed point theorem was uh, shown already to be PPAD complete in the original paper. Um, there's a lot of open problems too, but maybe one of the big ones, Smith, this thing about Hamiltonian cycles, uh, this is known to be PPA. It's not known to be in PPAD, nor is it known to be PPA complete. These would be the two natural places. I should put up a picture at some point about this. The two natural places it might sit. We do know that the Hamiltonian cycle, if you look at the, un the undirected graph of Hamiltonian cycles, there are exponentially long paths that go through it. So this thing of walking through the search space can take x exponentially long, so you cannot solve it that way. Uh, normally, once one finds these exponentially long things, then you have a completeness theorem right around the corner, but that hasn't been discovered yet, okay? Uh, the linear complementarity programming is in PPAD. It's not known to be PPAD complete. Nice little problem. Factoring, which is always a fun thing because of all the integers, it's many one reducible to PPA, but not by the, what I described earlier, but by randomized reductions. Okay. By a nice Can elegant. Can you speak about Nash, the matrix of the game is of exponential size? No, no, it's, oh, it's, it's, only, it's only polynomial size. The solution is polynomial. So actually, Nash is another one of these things where you do not have an exponential thing lurking in the background. Okay, so yeah. But if you want to prove, for example, that Sperner lemma complete is reducible to Nash. Somehow you have an exponential oracle for Sperner, and what the, how you can compress it to? Um, to hold on, uh, now you got me. Uh, Nash should be. Hold on, I've been through the proof. Yeah, I take it right. You're right. It's exponential. Yes. Hmm? It's complete. No, I, th I think you say that also they are complete in Oracle mode. Though. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're so yeah. In Oracle mode, that should be very strange. Yeah, no, no. Exponential yeah. To yeah, you're right, you're right. They're, 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 they're exponential size, yeah. They're, the proof is, yeah, yes, they're definitely exponential size. Yeah, I was just thinking of the proof, okay. Yeah, I got the wrong on the earlier slide too, okay. 
okay. Um, okay. So for where am I? Okay, so there's a typo here. Uh, at the top of the slide, it should say PPA, not PPAD. Okay, this is what I get for proofreading while I'm jet lagged. That's PPA up here. There's few or no complete problems for PPA. Um, and this also said should be PPA. If you take Sperner, Lemon, and Tucker, which I'll define for you on the next slide, they're PPA complete. Uh, and Papadimitriou claimed that Tucker is PPA complete, but his argument only showed, I'm sorry, he showed it's, they claimed it's PPAD complete. This one is PPAD, is correct. But his argument only showed it's PPAD hard. And like, likewise, the same way as in the two, two, 2D case, it's hard. So let me, uh, let me show you the Tucker lemma. So here's Tucker's lemma. So we let, I'll show you the picture on the next slide as well. We have a, this is one of these topological principles here. We've got a antipodally symmetric triangulation of the unit ball BN. So we're in dimension N. The unit ball, say, in the L, 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 L1 norm. Uh, lambda is a function mapping vertices of the triangulation to the values plus or minus one through plus or minus N. And for vertices V on the boundary, Lambda of minus v is minus lambda of v. Okay, in this case, T contains a one simplex with lambda v equal to minus lambda of v. Oh, no, w, the other end, yes, minus lambda of, of, of w. Let me do the picture of this here. So here it is with dimension two, n equals two. So I've triangulated the unit ball in the L1 norm. These edges on the boundary the lambda values are antipodally symmetric. So we have, see here, I've got this minus one here. Straight across from it, I've got this lambda value one. Okay, or here's a two, and straight across from it is this minus two. It's only symmetric on the boundary. Here I have this internal structure there that's not reflected over here on the other side, and so on. Okay, and then the theorem says that um, in this case, there's an edge where the endpoints have opposite values. So in this particular case, uh, there should be an edge, which you can probably spot right off, which is here, minus one to one. You have an edge that's got a minus one on one end and a one on the other end. So the proof of this is actually, the 2D case is not that hard. So you start at the origin, that's, Hmm? And so antipodal or antipodal, either one means uh, the negative of, and so and it just means negative, sort of court, I guess, co coordinate wise. So the point, so like minus one at the, this point is antipodal to this point. This point is antipodal to this point. It's just taking the negation across the, the uh, across, yeah. So, okay. So here, to, to, to do this, you can actually do this by walking through the triangulation. You start at the origin, and you, you walk, we're gonna walk around these edges. I'm gonna go over to this edge here that I've drawn to the middle of, up to this edge here, over, over, and over. Bang, okay, I've hit it, and there it is. Okay, so what's the rule I followed? I started off with, well, I started at the origin, and I found a edge adjacent to it where I have different labels on the endpoints, which if I, they were all the same, I could have just walked out until I reached that point or until I wrapped around. Here it started right at the, in this example, it started right at the origin. So here I've got a one on this side and a two on this edge of the edge. And then I think of walking along, keeping ones on my left and twos on my right. So think, we're thinking of walking, because here's a one, here's a two, we walk up into this triangle, and we look ahead and here there's an edge facing us with a one and a two, and we go out through that edge, and then we're in crossing that edge, think of going across that edge with a one on your left and a two on the right, and you're now inside the next triangle, 
and you look around and there's an edge with a one and a two on it. So you go there and you continue in this way until suddenly this thing over here is no longer a one or a two, it's a minus one. And so then we're guaranteed, we had a one and a two there and we found a, a minus one, so we're guaranteed an edge with a minus one on it. Okay. And this, I mean, this is just a special case of it, but this can always be made to work. So the proof is pretty easy. The thing is you may be walking around through this exponentially big space, right? Okay, and the theorem is then that these, the two, even the 2D case of Tucker is PPA complete. I got that correct on this slide here, okay. Tucker was already shown to be uh, in PPA, the general Tucker case already shown to be in PPA by Pop, by Pop and Michu in the original paper, okay. Good. So, and the general picture then, let me see what was next. Oh, here was the general picture of these particular classes. TFNP, the big, the big circle, is the general semantic class. Uh, PPAD is the small class down here. It's, it's a subclass of PPP, the, based on the pigeon principle, subclass of PPADS, based on the source sync principle, subclass of PPA. And in the Oracle setting, these are all known to be distinct. Uh, if, of course, outside of the Oracle setting, we don't know anything because if P is equal to NP, then they're all just equal to P, right? And I um, should mention there's another Tucker lemma in here, the truncated Tucker lemma, which is interesting because it's a low dimensional version of the Tucker lemma. I, I can't really define it exactly without getting into a rather complicated set of details, but Basically, we set k some fixed integer. The k truncated Tucker lemma is defined similarly to the Tucker lemma, except the lambda values are defined only on some particular low dimensional subspaces of the Tucker lemma. And uh, you can look up the definition if you want to. And basically, we came across this because it was we were looking at the knazer lovash theorem on the chromatic number of Knazer graphs, and that's proved via the Tucker lemma. And so uh, for fixed K, we're looking at what versions of the Tucker lemma would, could, could be used. And there's another whole hierarchy of new TFNP problems in there based on that. And in particular, there's a so-called octahedral Tucker lemma, which is the sort of minimal triangulation of, a, uh, of the ball BN. And it's not known whether that's PPA complete still. It seems to be a very different problem. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Good? Plenty of time. Plenty of time, okay, good. All right, ahead of time. I don't think you've done early at this rate, okay, good. So, um, so any rate, uh, so that was what I wanted to say about the complexity approach to uh, TFNP. And so now I wanna talk about the bounded arithmetic approach to TFNP. So, yeah. Before you begin, so uh, about this whole class TFNP, you said that, uh, what about problems, well, you said something at the beginning. Oh, yeah, so it's, so TFNP is a semantic class, which so, means that something is, you know, R of X, Y is in there because for all X there is a Y. Um, and so all these other classes are in, you know, we have a complete problems. So for instance, for PPP, we've got a complete problem, namely the pigeon principle. So we can think of it. Defined by certain problems. Okay. They're defined by certain problems, okay. right? <laughs> exactly. So these are all defined by certain problems. We just said, here's a problem, and then we take the closure under many one reductions. And that immediately gives us a complete problem because we, we put it in there, and it gives us an, enum an enumeration because we can enumerate all many one reductions to the complete problem. <laughs> okay. Would it be possible to formulate some of these classes in more, you know, universal logical ways? Uh, like the class NP is not. Right, that's right. So NP is defined semantically, but it's got a complete, then you prove it's got a complete problem. as a theorem that it's a complete problem rather than they defined in terms of the complete problem, yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to be any way to do that with TFNP. Likewise, we don't have any complete problem known for NP intersect co-MP. Solvers. Um, well, there's a lot of work in approximating these things. I'm not maybe prepared to talk about this, but there's, so there's a lot of, like, for instance, you've heard of sim simulated annealing probably as a way to look for minima. 
right? So there you're looking for minimum things. That's the same kind of thing. You're looking for search problems. So that would be like looking for minimum cost solutions, right? Uh, you're not just looking for um, hmm. Not sure that's quite the right answer, though, because there a local solution is not what you're looking for, because you, you find a local solution, but you really want something that's better, a global solution. Um, no one's really worked much on solvers for these problems, I don't believe, okay. They don't lend themselves that well to that, yeah. And also, before you, you switch to, to logic, so there is one more complexity. So some of these problems look to be local. So, for example, in, 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 in Sperner Lemma, you need to find some triangle. So, it, what you saw yes. is different depending. So, then it makes uh, reasonable to ask how many queries we need for, for the oracle to find something. Right. Or, uh, in, in other things, if, if, if we, how many, what is the uh, complexity of the resolution proof or resolution type proof for, for this? Right. So, and what, what is the state of here? So for them, are the upper bounds known, or local bounds, well, there are some open problems? Or, right, and so... There's also probably for the, some additional restriction on locality. Reduction will also conserve this. Yeah, so the, in general, of course, if P equals NP, then we have short solutions without, this, you know, but that could have still a lot of queries, no, no, I guess. In, Setting, of course, not. Yeah, so but if, if we need to find the yes. Sperner, Sperner right. What's example. yeah? Well, what is known that is if you start at a particular in, for most of these problems, certainly for PLS, I think it's true for the other ones as well. If you you're you're given an initial thing and then you're walking locally to find a sink a sink or a minimum co a local a local minimum cost item, it's known if you start at a particular one and what ask the question of what's at the end of that path that you started at. That's P space hard because you can simulate the computation of a, of a P-space machine in this process. But it may be, even though that's P-space hard, it may be easier to find some minimum yeah, but, cost but thing. you say about the non-oracle state. It's not, yeah. But just have to look for query complexity. Right, so yeah. So you want to find a, 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 a triangle where Sperner lemma is false, by, uh, and we are allowed to ask any label for any vertex. Right. No, that's plausible. I don't know a theorem of that type. That's a very good question. It seems very plausible that you can make an oracle that's, that thwarts you, and I think that surely should be known for PLS. Yeah, I think that should be known for PLS, right? Because you could just say, you know, just whenever you do a query, you just get some, worth, you get some worthless answer from the oracle. <laughs> and so... In another word, it's more or less the depth of the resolution, uh, tree resolution proof of non-existence because it's yes. just, just a search for, for a, 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 it, it, it seems that just... I think that that's correct too, yeah. Just Brock told me something about this, but... I think of it more in terms of proofs in T22 and bound with arithmetic, but it's okay. really, or, t, or in T1, or in T one two, but that's really the same thing, right? You know, um, so yes, you make an oracle so that whenever, you know, the oracle has the property, say you're in, in PLS and you're asking, I've got my initial, my uh, initial non-minimum cost solution and I can ask the oracle query to get its neighbor and I could keep doing that. Or I could just ask the query, the oracle about something random out there. But every time I go out and ask the, an oracle query about someplace random, I just get some high cost thing that doesn't do me any good, right? And so you can just argue then that uh, I have to make a lot of queries. I have to make that ex exponentially many queries to bring the cost down. Something can count. So yeah. It's not, not completely useless to ask something. Yeah. Uh, right, right. Yeah. Okay. And we are going to talk about uh, bound arithmetic proofs, but that is another way of saying um, propositional logic proofs. Okay. And, and we'll, in particular, we're going to relate these things. Well, okay. Let's just go for it. So I know you don't know probably. Very few of you know bound arithmetic, but so I'll just give you the quickest little overview of it. Uh, these are weak fragments of our arithmetic, of, of piano arithmetic, uh, which is the usual arithmetic for a logical system with zero, successor plus and times, and induction for all formulas. But here we restrict induction rather sharply um, to fragments of the bounded form, formulas. And there's a hierarchy of theories uh, with 
rather arcane names. S12 is a subtheory of T12, is a subtheory of S22, and so forth. This curly equals means that S22 is conservative or T12, which means of certain types of classes, a form, formulas have the same strength. And there's also these second order theories, U12, V12, and I've put a dot, dot, dot there, but no one ever studies those. Maybe they should. And, but these are theories which can formulate things about arithmetic, and we can prove totality of functions, or relations, really, I should say, and then use those to define TFNP problems. So the, these particular types of bounded arithmetic were actually studied originally in my thesis um, more years ago than I care to mention. And uh, here I've got a, for instance, the theory S12 can define what I call here sigma v1. So sigma v1 is another word for NP. The functions that are definable with NP graph are exactly the polynomial time functions. Now another way to say this is that the TFNP problems definable in S12 are precisely the polynomial time functions. Okay. So from the point of TFNP, that's not particularly in interesting because we really want harder problems than that. Uh, so the next step up would be T12 or equivalently S22. It defines functions that are polynomial time with an oracle for an NP query. But you'll notice here the, the graph, the, the relation defining the graph of the function is sigma B2. It's no longer NP, so its complexity is higher than we want. So as set up here, this doesn't define a TFNP problem. And the same thing goes down here, all the way down. The formulas defining the relation R get, big, get worse and worse. Uh, so we don't get TFNP problems out of this work. Um, just to mention, though, U12, this will come back up again, corresponds to P space, to, pol to polynomial space, in terms of the complexity of what it can formalize. So basically, you can think of it as logic that's powerful enough to work with, pol with polynomial space predicates and prove properties about them. Um, and V12 is similar for exponential time. It's powerful enough to prove theorems about exponential time. Uh, T12 is powerful enough to prove things about P to the NP predicates and so forth. Okay. So um, this state of the okay, K was actually a fair amount of time, but eventually, uh, Jan Krajicek and I showed that the TFNP problems, which are definable in T12, this was the second line of the table on the previous page, are exactly the polynomial local search problems. So this was sort of the first sort of relation between the two approaches, right? In particular, PLS is equivalent, another way to say this is PLS is, is many one complete for the sigma one definable functions of T12. So sigma one definable means that the graph, that relation R I was talking about earlier, the graph of the function is definable by an NP predicate. And that's, before R was P, now R is NP, NP, right? But the point is that's good enough because you can guess, you can say that, we're talking about does there exist a Y such as R of X, Y? Well, you can, R is an existential statement, so you could just not only get the Y, but also get the rest of the, ex, the um, existential statement as part of the output of the relation, so that way you get TFNP problems, okay? So this was the first thing, was that S12, S, sorry, T, T12 and PLS then are related properly. And then uh, another 10 or so years passed, and no one made any progress, and then actually a fair amount of progress has happened in the last seven or eight years, mm, whatever. So um, the first step was Krajicek, Skelly, and Toppin. Uh, well, okay, I'm not a little bit out of history order here. There's a harebrandized PLS problems, which are definable with uh, a co-NP predicate defining the set of possible solutions. And they showed that this so-called colored PLS is many one complete for TFNP problems of T22 stepping up one level on the bound arithmetic hierarchies. And then there's this, this uh, little more recent work of Arnold Beckman and myself on hair and dice PLS search problems for pi PK minus one definable solutions. And those are exactly the many one complete problems for TK2. Um, um, of, I don't want to get into the definitions of these things. Herbron functions, some of you may have heard of before. This is, these are functions that witness values for quantifiers. And so this is how we drop the quantifier level back down. Uh, the technical details are rather for, rather for bidding, but uh, I don't want to get into it in this talk, okay. 
And then backing up a little bit, back from the early days of bounded arithmetic, uh, going back to the work of Paris, Wilkie, and Woods, uh, the weak pigeonhole principle has been a very important property both for bounded arithmetic and for, pro for propositional proof complexity. So with pigeonhole principle I talked about before, said there was no mapping from a set of size x into a size, set of size x minus one. The weak pigeonhole principle says there's no mapping from a set of size two times x into a set of size x. Okay, so this is weaker than the pigeonhole principle. It's harder to stuff two x many pigeons into x slots in an objective fashion than it is to map x into x minus one because you have to double up everybody, right, on average. So it should be easier to prove the weak pigeonhole principle than it is to prove the pigeonhole principle, okay? Um, also, the talk from uh, Sasha Shen this morning, everything there he was talking about could be done with the weak pigeonhole principle. Counting there wasn't so precise, right? <laughs> okay, so it's actually rather important in many app applications. One of them is actually the Ramsey theorem. So a, a graph on x vertices has either a clique or an independent set of size uh, one half log x, okay? So, uh, and so here we have that the weak pigeonhole principle, it's provable, by which I mean it's prov provably total, thus definable as a TFMP search problem in the theory T12, uh, T, sorry, T22. Uh, Paris Wilkie Woods did this originally in I delta, they call it I delta naught plus omega one, the version of bound arithmetic they were working with, and they did it for showing the existence of infinitely many primes in these theories. So they uh, used the weak pigeonhole principle to prove the existence of infinitely many primes. I don't know how that relates. It's very intriguing, I need to go back and look. They gave a rather different proof, but it'd be very interesting to know if maybe this is a simpler proof, and I would be interested to see if that actually works here. Okay, um, and Masil Patasi Woods more, uh, more recently, now some time ago, uh, improved it to be actually in T22. The, the older proof was in T32. Okay, yes. Ah, uh, yes, so, okay, so I didn't say what these things were. T, so the subscript two means polynomial growth rate. The superscript two means you're doing length, you're doing or, sorry, it's T22. It's you're doing ordinary induction on functions with two alter, alternations of quantifiers. So their form you know, exists y less than or equal to some bound for all z less than or equal to some bound uh, a of x, y, z, and then you're doing induction with, with respect to x. Okay. So there's two quantifiers. These are the things at the second level of the polynomial time hierarchy, and you're allowing induction on those. T32 would be three quantifiers and so forth. It's, it's provably total in this theory, yes. Uh-huh, yes. Good. <laughs> right, yeah. So it's a very, very clever proof, right? So it's a really gorgeous proof. Um, you know, and so it involves uh, ideas that were rediscovered later on for, uh, for function oracles and so on, for random function oracles and so on, where it's come into these things, or, or pseudo-random function oracles. So how you create a pseudo-random function oracle from a pseudo-random oracle, the same construction that Paris Wilkie Woods used for this. Okay. Uh -huh. In terms of the first part of your talk, so this weak pigeonhole principle, it's known to be weak in terms of, of, of many one reduction. Uh, yes. Yes, it is, actually. I'm pretty sh yes, surely, surely good. Um, is there no, no one actually, I don't think that's written out anywhere. Good question, but certainly the difference in the theories they work with. The weak pigeonhole principle is not many one reducible here. So um, it's not provably reducible. By the theorems we have in hand, there's no theorem in bounded arithmetic of the reduction. <laughs> but I guess there's, I'm not sure. Provably reducible is <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 this, this, has got, this has got to be provable because you should be able to do this with an oracle kind of construction again, yes. Yeah, this has got to be done. Okay, yeah, yes. T22, oh, the, the, oh, no, the weak pigeonhole principle, so the full pigeonhole principle is not in any of the TK2 classes. Okay, so that's, that's a, a theorem, but it is in the, it's in the U, it is in U12, 
the P space thing, because it can just directly count in, 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 in P space. You could search through and, and just do directly. Yeah, so yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's doable in the theory U, it's pro provably total in the theory U12, which corresponds to P space. Now, P space as a computational class is way too powerful for a pigeonhole principle, right? But, um, okay. Um, whoops, wrong button. So, Ramsey's theorem is similarly provably total or definable as a TFMP problem in T32. Go up one level. Okay, and this is due to Pavel Pudlock. And there's a, another theory I say see you know, aerobic uh, for a theory that's a little too complicated, for a theory that corresponds to uh, talking about randomized reductions. Um, can, do, can do like approximate counting. Um, so Ramsey's theorem, you'll notice that the complexity of Ramsey's theorems seems to be a little harder than that of weak pigeon principle. I don't know any theorem that says there's no oracle reduction. It's actually probably a good idea to try to look at that. Okay, okay. So these are, okay, so those are very interesting. They're not, no, we don't have any completeness classes for these things. So for things with many one completeness, I wanna run through some of these that are done pretty quickly and then talk about a new result after that. So there's a Herbrandized ordering principle. So this, is, this states that if you have a well-ordering uh, curly less than on less on set of X objects, think of it as X, X eventually again, again uh, you cannot have a total predecessor function. So uh, here I mean, it should say probably immediate predecessor function. So the total, a, a predecessor function would take an input X and produce the immediate predecessor of X under the ordering. That can't be total because it's a finite set and it's a linear ordering, so it has to have a least element, right? So we, when you say well ordering, it's, it's well just, order. just linear ordering. Lin I mean linear ordering there, yes, linear ordering, yeah. Uh, yeah, slip of the typing there, because I'm thinking of a predecessor function, you have to, has to stop. It's a finite set, it has nothing really to do with well ordering, yeah. Yeah, yeah but it could yeah. be additional x somehow. Yeah, like yeah, addition. should probably be linear ordering, okay. Uh, okay. And then there's another rather complicated principle to state in one sentence, but I did my best at it, which is a winning strategy for a two-player K-round game is preserved under many-one reductions between games, even if you iterate the many-one reductions exponentially many times. Okay, so it's a principle that you have two games and you've got a series of reductions between them and the winning strategy is, is preserved as you go down the thing. And these are complete for the hereditary ordering principle is uh, provable in T22, but it's not, it's unlikely that it's many one complete for anything there. The, the game induction is many one complete for the, the TFMP problems of TK2. And there's some similar results by Quidlock and Toppin as well on min, max min games. Let me uh, not say too much about that and go on. And then there's local improvement principles. This sort of falls in the same category. I don't want to say too much about it, but just want to throw it up to be complete. Uh, local improvement principles. So here the idea is we have a directed acyclic graph on the finite, but big. And uh, we think of doing the following. We start off by giving every node in the graph labels of, of cost zero, and we sweep across the graph, updating the labels from cost zero to cost one and then we sweep back across the graph, updating labels from cost one to cost two, and we repeat k times. And this principle says in some indirect sort of fashion that this can be done k times, okay? Or there's some local condition that stops you from doing it, okay? And these local improvement principles then are complete for just everything in sight, so this is the nice thing about this. Uh, Kolagicic, uh, um, Nguyen and Toppen showed that the LIK, this is the linear, this is the local improvement principle with K rounds, is many one complete for the TFNP problems of TK2. Um, if you don't have any restriction on the number of rounds, just can do it exponentially many times, it's many one complete for V12, the thing for exponential time. There's also, maybe I won't bother to state all these things, there's other things for uh, linear LLI is where the graph is just aligned. You know, the, the nodes are linearly ordered in the graph. Um, it's a directed acyclic graph, so it's just a line. If the graph is a rectangle, it's RLI, and we have a bunch of results 
giving just sort of everything in sight on those. Ex well, there's some open questions on the RLIs. Let me uh, maybe pass on those. I want to say more about that. Uh, I want to end up with one, however, logic-related, many one complete problem. So here, the stepping back a little bit, a Frege proof is a propositional logic system using modus ponens as its only rule of inference. And so its connectors are and, or, not, and if, then, and, mo and modus ponens is the only uh, rule of inference allowed. And we've got some finite set of axioms, or axiom schemes, like A and B implies A. We define the proof size to be the number of symbols in the proof. And related to Frege proofs, what's known as extended Frege proofs, uh, which allows us to introduce new variables abbreviating other formulas. So if we have a formula A that doesn't involve X, we can take a new variable X and add the, as an axiom the extension rule X if and only if A. And then this lets us use X as an abbreviation for A henceforth. You can iterate this process so that once you've introduced some extension variables, you can use them to form a new formula A and get a new extension variable abbreviating that. In this way, you can abbreviate exponentially big formulas by variables. Effectively, you can encode polynomial size circuits into extension variables. And uh, you can reason about poly polynomial size circuits. So um, the intuition here, I just said it right here, the intuition there is that Extended Frege proofs can reason about Boolean circuits. Frege proofs can reason about Boolean formulas. And the way, again, extension, extended Frege proofs, proofs handle Boolean circuits is it introduces variables for the, the gates in the circuit. And if we allow substitution rule, in, 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 as I said, the classical textbook, it gives what? If you allow the substitution rule, so Frege plus substitution is equivalent to Frege, to extended yes. Frege. Okay, yeah. Okay, so the substitution rule allows you to take a formula A of X and take another formula B and infer A of B, replacing everywhere the variable X by the formula B. Yeah, but, but only with provable formulas. Only with provable formulas, yes. Otherwise, that's, it's not sound, right? Yes, so, so yeah. it's, it's kind, of, kind of a weaker thing. Yeah, so, so yes, it's right. It, it's equivalent, or you can just directly plug circuits in and say that my line of my proof is a circuit. And you can make sense out of that, too. Um, and it's all, all equivalent. It's generally conjectured that Boolean circuits are more expressive than Boolean formulas. So likewise, it's generally conjectured that extended Frege proofs may be shorter, super, pol super polynomially shorter than Frege proofs. These are open questions, and we know no direct linkage between the two questions either. OK. OK, so that's our background. So OK, on Frege proofs, so here's an example of a Frege proof. I'm going to apply A implies A. Uh, usually once you see a proof of A implies A, you sort of wonder why anyone messes with Frege proofs because it's a big mess, right? But the first line is an axiom, A implies B implies A. The second line is an axiom, A implies B implies A implies A implies B implies A implies A implies A implies A implies A. <laughs> okay, appropriately parenthesized. Uh, this is a, you know, this is actually, this axiom scheme is actually, let's say X implies Y, implies, x implies y implies z implies, x implies z, right? So I've just substituted a and b and appropriately. And then we do modus ponens. So we take the first line and modus ponens it with the second line and we get a third line. And we have another axiom, a implies, b implies, a implies, a. And then we, again, that's the same type of axiom as the first line, except we replaced B with B implies A there. These are axiom schemes. And then we do modus ponens on the fourth and fifth lines, and we get the formula A implies A. Okay. You can replace B by A to make it even more C. You can replace B by A. Actually, I'm going to do something slightly different. Uh, here, I just, it was interesting, like the slides, I realized that normally I would just put B, A instead of B in there, but I thought it might be clearer to put the B there. Okay, so now I'm going to do something. I'm going to get a, right out of Frege proof of a contradiction. I'm using bottom for falsehood contradiction, and I've got a proof here. There's a proof of A, and then it's followed by a proof of not A, which I haven't drawn out because it would be the same thing. Okay, and so, well, I changed the, B's to not A's, and I actually changed something else too, I guess. 
So here I've got a Frege proof, and it ends up, it's got a, it proves A and it proves not A. Something went wrong, right? So this generates a search form, is find the mistake in the proof. Huh, where's the mistake in the proof? Got a couple of logicians in the audience. <laughs> So wait, just to give you a hint. Frankly speaking, it's confusing. First of all, it's confusing that you, you have this implication without, without parentheses. Right. So it's, it's, it makes things impossible to read. So, so yes, it's impossible. So OK, I left off the parentheses. Parentheses associate from, um, let me get it right, it's from, left, from, from right to left, right? So A implies B implies C means if A, then if B, then C, right? So it means A and B implies C. Actually, just to give you a hint here, here was the previous. This slide was a correct proof. And I did something going to the second slide, <laughs> which I did two things. I changed the, the Bs to not As, and I did something else. That was the first part of the things that already been there. Yeah, actually, both parts of the proof. You can't prove A because that's, you can only prove valid statements. So the first part has to have a proof. And the, the part not shown of the second part has the same mistake, because it's just the dual <laughs> proof, right? You can't prove not A either. So again, the previous slide was there, 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 there. What went wrong? <laughs> hmm. So the, the third line is false. Third line is false, OK. But the mistake is actually, he, the third line does follow from the second line by, first and second line by modus ponens. So the mistake was there. In the previous slide, it was A implies A was out here before. And now I just put A, right? <laughs> See, there was an A implies A there. OK. OK. So now it's just an A. OK. So now uh, this leads to the Frege consistency problem as a, as, a, as a TFNP problem, as a total NP search problem. So the idea is you get an exponentially long Frege proof P. Think of it as coded with an oracle X of I. X. X of I gives you the ith symbol in the proof. Okay? So already there's something wrong here. X of I gives you the ith symbol in the proof. The formulas in the exponentially long proof can be exponentially big. In fact, that's crucial. We would very much restrict the strength of Frege proofs if we made their formulas really short. So we have an exponentially long proof with exponentially many symbols. And the formulas in the proof may be exponentially big. And um, the goal is to find, and the last line of the proof is falsehood. You know, it's a, con a contradiction. And the goal is to find the mistake in the proof. Okay. But that the oracle says uh, to which formulas we apply modus ponens. And yes. And so I have to say more than this, because to, to say it's a mistake, there's two things. I'll put this on the next slide. The oracle not only tells you the symbol, but embedded with a symbol is when you have a form, formula, it tells you either which formulas it came from by modus ponens or which axiom scheme it's an instance of. But the particular thing is which formula it came from by modus ponens. The other thing is because the formulas are exponentially big, the parentheses in the formula have pointers to their matching parentheses. Okay. Okay, otherwise you wouldn't be able to tell us. Because our goal is to output a polynomial size piece of information that describes the error in the proof. So the input is the second order x and a size parameter, little x. And the output is some set of index values, i1 through il, so that those values along with x, the, the knowledge of the symbols xi1 through xil is enough to show that it's not a valid Frege proof. So that's what we want for an answer. So, would, so, the thing would, so one way to do this would be that maybe we discover that some formula down here says it's inferred by modus ponens from formula here and formula here, but the, maybe the 17th symbol in this formula doesn't match the 17th symbol in this formula, so it couldn't have been using modus ponens against this one against that one or something like that. So you don't have to find the mistake. You don't have to examine the exponentially big formulas. You just need to examine the corresponding symbols in the exponentially big formulas and say that they don't match up for purposes of modus ponens. Or if you have an axiom like A implies B implies A, it could be that the first A might differ in its 17th symbol from the second A. Right, we another way to say it's a mistake. Okay. Okay, so that's the, the search problem. 
And just to say what I already did here, the, the formulas are fully parenthesized, okay? They will put commas at the ends of them, and each comma has the type of inference for the previous formula, whether it was an axiom or modus ponens, plus pointers to the formulas used as high hypotheses. Each parenthesis has a pointer to its matching parentheses. So there's all sorts of ways formulas could fail to be invalid. Maybe the formulas are ill-formed, the matching parentheses don't match up, but that can be determined by finding a pair of supposedly matching parentheses that cross each other in terms of their in influence and so forth. So any syntactic error in the Frege proof can be identified with, by only picking out finitely many places in the proof. Okay. All right. So the theorem here then is that the Frege consistency problem is many one complete for the TFNP problems of U12. Okay. The extended Frege consistency problem is many one complete for the TFNP problems of V12. So these were the theories for P space and exponential time. So, I don't know, I think this seems to give a nice sort of elegant way of talking about this. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. It's just a, a, a well-defined, well-defined search problem. Uh, is it complete somehow in, in, in any class in the first, in the sense of without any logic? Ah. Can you say something uh, absolute, so to say? Well, okay, so this certainly defines a class because it's just a problem. The Frege consistency problem yeah. is independent of bounded arithmetic, right? Yeah. So it defines a class. You just take the many one reducible things to it, and they're exactly the things provably total in U12. It includes PLS, PP. I didn't, I didn't, yeah. I didn't understand much about this proof, but, but still, still, still. So it's many one complete in the ordinary sense. In the, in the ordinary yeah. sense. In the ordinary there sense. Are, yeah. but, but in this ordinary sense, probably not all problems it will, are, uh, are you know, this probable. Yeah, yeah. So but it, is TFMP problems in U, U1 and 2 is a certain class of problems yeah. for which this particular problem is complete in the ordinary sense. <laughs> External, you external. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So internal okay. is needed to define this term. Well, the thing is that there may be, you have to think of the difference between intentional and extensional definitions of classes. You may have some class that TFNP can't prove is a total NP search problem, but there'll be some equivalent definition of it, not provably equivalent, but some equivalent definition of it that TFNP, mm -hmm. that T22, T, T sorry, T, that U12, sorry, can prove is reducible to, you know, is, is total. And solutions to it also give solutions to the other class, right? But it may not be able to prove it that, that, that solutions to the second one give solutions to the first one. But so just compared to, to the pre previous classes, it's PPA, DPA, D, yeah. how, how this okay. Frege consistency problem so, class. So this is stronger. It, it is, it, it's bigger. It's bigger. Well, I don't know about strictly bigger, but well, actually, it's even strictly bigger because all of these things are provably total in U12. PPAD, PPA, PPPP are all provably total in U12. And does it imply that it's strongly bigger in terms of just reductions? It does actually, in, 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 in the Oracle setting it does, because that graph I showed up earlier, P, PPP has things that are not many one reducible to, uh, to PPA, and PPA has things that are not many one reducible to PPP. So, uh, but those things are both reducible, those are all provable in U12, so they're reducible to the Frege consistency problem. So the Frege consistency problem is strictly stronger than those in, in the Oracle setting. So it's a candidate for being complete, or? Well, I don't know what you mean by, oh, complete for the... For the entire class, you say that you don't know whether it's a complete problem. Oh, um, in the Oracle setting, you mean, yeah. yeah. And thought about that. That should be... Sh um, I suppose it's a candidate. I would be very dubious that it is. It doesn't sound, I don't, I don't believe there's a complete problem there. <laughs> but it could be, yeah. And what I don't know how to do is separate, oh, good, good open question is, is the extended Frege consistency search problem harder than the Frege consistency search problem? So I don't know that question. I, I assume it is in, in the Oracle setting. If 
V12 can provably give a many one reduction from U12 to V12, then Frege systems P simulate extended Frege systems. So, there's, but again, that seems unlikely. Yeah. Uh, so I, I mentioned a few slides back. It's not known whether Frege systems can polynomially simulate extended Frege systems. If V12 can, if if, if U12, however, can prove the totality of the extended Frege consistency problem, then provably they would. Seems unlikely. I must say I could give another talk some other year on Frege versus extended Frege. And, there's all these indications that maybe they're the same, but I don't believe it anyway. Okay. Okay. I would call it Frege inconsistency. It maybe it should be the Frege inconsistency problem, yeah. So Pop and Mitru and Paul Goldberg have been working on related problems recently, and they call this the wrong proof problem. Okay, maybe a better name. Um, so, okay, so I'm just ready to end up with some open questions. Uh, first one's a fairly general thing. It'd be nice, to, there's all sorts of problems that might come out of, that'd be good to study looking at the alignment between the complexity approach and the bounded arithmetic approach, because it's been different communities working in the different areas. So for instance, weak pigeonhole principle is clearly some sort of natural TFMP class. Maybe it should be looked more from the complexity point of view of what is, are there complete problems that are natural from the complexity setting? Um, some of the things that was talked about in the earlier talk today, for instance. Um, are there bound arithmetic theories that correspond to PPA or PPAD or PPADS? Uh, the way that T22 corresponds to PLS, for instance. Um, uh, from, for the people who work in bound arithmetic, uh, now that we have these results for U12 and V12, there may well be proof systems whose consistency search or inconsistency search problem is many one complete for those theories, uh, for instance. Probably res log for T12 would be a good can big candidate here. So res log means resolution, but extended to, so that instead of being clauses of literals, it has clauses of small conjunctions. A um, uh, couple of my favorite open problems. I, I mentioned RLI earlier. The rectangular local improvement principle with two passes, it's completely, well, it's, it, it, we, it sits awkwardly in the middle. We haven't categorized it exactly. The one truncated Tucker uh, these both things have polynomial size extended Frege proofs. It's open whether they have short Frege proofs, so another set of my open problems. All right. Thank you. So I have one more stupid question. Oh, uh, thank, you questions. thank you for all the questions. Thank you for all the questions. So you say that there, are, there is a, a, a complexity community and proof theoretic community. But let's stay with our proof theoretic community. So, uh, for example, there is a weak pigeonhole principle and uh, pigeonhole principle. And you can study the theories when something is provable. And also, you can look, for example, for resolution proof and the size of the resolution proof. Uh, and in both cases, probably you can prove that one of them is, is stronger than the other. So you okay. need more longer resolution proofs for, 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 for pigeonhole than for big pigeonhole. Mm -hmm. You need stronger theories. Yes. But are these results somehow related to each other? So uh, or, or it's just two different parts of proof that the community which are not... Uh, oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, they're, no, no, they're definitely the same people doing these kind of things. Actually, weak pigeonhole principle versus pigeonhole principle, we know that these things, they both require exponentially big res, resolution proofs, and there's very, some, some ra so res, there is no separation between well, some class of resolution, like, uh, um, well, let me see. Or well, yeah, so there's, well, let me see. So, well, the, even the full resolution, Dag-like dag and so on requires exponential size proofs for, for weak pigeonhole principle. But there may be some separation up, up at the exponential level. I, no, I, okay. just, yeah. just, the, the, maybe this is a bad example of specific principles. Right, yes. But the, yeah. there are two, two, if, if our philosophers are interested in just one principle is weaker than the other one, yeah. there are two ways to understand this inside the, the, inside the uh, this, this uh, community of proof theory. Yeah. And still still they are not related to each other somehow. Or, or, or there is some form of relation. So you can uh, but conclude that if you know some, bound, that some bounds are bigger, 
then, then you can prove the theory is weak. Or, so, or, or it's uh, let's see, I'm not quite sure what the question is. So, can I, can yeah, yeah, you can explain it in the question. <laughs> okay. Let's ask a very simple question. Is there any formal relation between results in proof, propositional proof complexity and bound relation? So yes, <laughs> okay, yes. So I was so. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for, for for separating two principles, you can separate them and prove complexity. Let's translate once again. Well, well, the the usual problem though is that um, ah, so good question here. So generally though, what you get is that you can't provably get that prove you can't if you have something's provable in one theory and not another, yeah. then uh, you don't you know that there's uniform proofs. <laughs> In propositional proof complexity that goes with provability and bounded arithmetic, but you may have, you never quite rule out the possibility of non uniform proofs of a certain complexity. So let's see. Um, but yeah, but pretty much these problems go hand in hand. So provability in a, a theory like TK2 corresponds to uniform provability in, say, constant depth Frege proofs. Okay. Um, so these things pretty much go hand in hand. Um, and there's, there's usually two connections between provability and bounded arithmetic and provability in uh, pro pro propositional proof complexity. So TK2 can correspond directly to by the first sec Sipser type tran translation or the Paris Wilkie translation to depth K Frege proofs where you have K alternations of ands and wars, right? Or it can go through the Cook translation for, for S12, for instance, that corresponds to extended Frege via the Cook translations. So that's a very weak theory. So there's two different translations there. Uh, T12 corresponds to res log a lot of times too when you're looking at ex exponential things. There's different translations available, let's put it that way. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. It probably, probably the stuff should get worked out better. There's the, the road, road map is a little complicated, but. There's many translations between bounded arithmetic and propositional proof complexity. But basically, if you have a separation result in bounded arithmetic, it would yield some sort of independence result in, in proposition. In, 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 uh, yeah. In proof complexity. In, in yes. Yeah. Right. Upper bounds and bounded arithmetic yield upper bounds. And just, not, but not automatically, but the but just the, the, the same proof technique can be used. No, no, even using some general, some general, general mat mathematical results. results. Which were probably not in all cases, <laughs> as Sam carefully yeah. tried to yeah, qualify. <laughs> yes, right. right. <laughs> but basically, I think what you wanted to know is really that there are such examples of general results which. Right. So you can prove some lower bound for something which doesn't mention any proof complexity, yeah. but the the tools in the middle of the proof, you use, use this complicated induction, bounded induction, okay. yours and so So let me, let me mention one question here, for instance, that's, that's sort of re relevant to what you're asking. Let's take T, TK2, the kth level of the bound arithmetic. I, bet, I was talking about the TFNP problems in this talk, so that would be what existential statements are provable. But let's just think about what polynomial time predicates are provable, not, not anything existential, just, just what properties hold. So it's not known, for instance, whether TK versus the next theory up, TK plus one, if they prove different things there, right? Either for the TFNP problems or for just the plain polynomial time identities. This corresponds to the following question is, could you take refutations? So think of refuting sets of clauses. Are there sets of clauses whose refutations, when you allow depth K Frege systems, K alt alternations of ands and ors, are necessarily longer than refutations that use k plus one alternations. And when I say necessarily, I mean, say x, x, x say x, exponentially longer, okay? We know some super polynomial separations, but they're very, very modest ones, but exponentially longer. Um, so the question is separating depth k from depth k plus one Frege proofs when proving, when refuting sets of clauses. Uh, we don't know any exponential separation there, which is very, uh, uh, what's the right word? It's, it's, it's very frustrating because we know from uh, Hostad switching lemma that the expressibility in depth K circuits is, more, is less powerful than the expressibility in depth K plus one circuits, right? So be, when you have a difference in expressibility, it would seem like, oh, if I can say more, I should be able to prove more, right? But 
You know, we don't know that, right? So, so even though this corresponds to the fact we have oracle separations, we have, we have relativized oracle separations for tk plus one from, from tk, but not involving just, say, the polynomial time identities or the TFNP provably total functions, only at the higher formula complexity. Okay. So we'd like to, we would like to get those. That, would, that seems like a very hard problem, but nonetheless seems doable because we have the complexity side of things, we have the Hofstadt switching lemma. So it seems like we ought to be able to prove these things. I also wanted to ask a question related to, um, uh, to so uh, the question is the following. So, uh, so you show at uh, the first part of your talk a host of polynomial uh, uh, search problems which were sort of uh, complete for certain classes and there were some equivalence between some of these problems which were shown some of them conjectures and uh, mm -hmm. so there was this uh, picture but would that picture translate into some sort of reverse mathematics relation between <laughs> <laughs> these the same principles formulated in, in bounded area uh -huh. yeah so well i did ask this question here at the end of their theories corresponding to ppa and ppad and so on uh, go back to that picture here so where did it go there it is um, so here is the picture. So we know in the oracle setting that these classes are distinct and the inclusions hold like this, right? Um, so, so these three classes, PPA, PPADS, and PPAD, all correspond to some sort of mod two counting principle, right? Because they all, so it's, it's interesting that already the mod two counting principle splits into different mod two counting principles. There's the, the sort of the pure mod two counting principle, the undirected graphs, right? And then there's the directed graphs version, the directed graph with sync version. And so these are, it's odd actually that these are different, right? PPP is some sort of more general counting kind of thing. So one would sort of imagine, I haven't carried this out, out at all, but you would sort of imagine if you took bounded arithmetic in the first order version of bounded arithmetic and you added a mod two counting quantifier or something like that, you should get something corresponding to one of these classes. Or if you added a general counting quantifier, exact counting quantifier now, you should get something akin to PPP. But no one's carried this out, okay? And it might be hard, right? Um, it then answer your, partly answered your question, I guess. Uh, but, yeah, so the, uh, you know. The answer was, you haven't, there wasn't any definite uh, studies of this. Right? Yeah, there haven't been any definite studies of that type, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you.